The lures enticing ordinary citizens to participate in off-world adventures are very strong. After all, most people alive today witnessed NASA landing men on the moon in 1969, and or they grew up with a full slate of science fiction shows de depicting how those first off-world steps were going to take us where no man had gone before as we lived among the stars. But since 1972, man has once again been almost strictly earthbound, with the exception of the astronauts aboard the ISS and LEO. The six manned moon missions failed to generate enough persistent interest to maintain a steady stream of men and women traveling between Earth and its biggest satellite, in no small part because those trips exposed our moon as a barren, lifeless, airless ball of dust, devoid of anything remarkable. Since then, probes have determined there are possibly pockets of water ice on the moon, and it is theorized that the moon may have reserves of helium-3, with some experts believing that helium-3 will be the breakthrough material required to achieve nuclear fusion. Assuming this to be true, many world governments have now taken a renewed interest in lunar missions with an eye on mining the lunar surface in a modern day gold rush. But for individuals looking for their off-world opportunities, there has been a different type of gold rush, mainly benefiting scam artists with schemes that should have been all too familiar, but were just too enticing to resist. A heads up, this is going to be our longest episode to date, but make sure you watch right through to the end. We promise the payoff is worth it. In 2012, every news outlet in the world was reporting that Mars One, a small Dutch organization founded in 2011 by a man named Bas Lansdorp, was going to be holding a competition that would wind up sending 100 people to colonize Mars. Mars One was intriguing. They would hold a competition to select 100 people who would train towards colonizing Mars, and TV cameras would follow their every move, from the selection process through their training and final selections, en route to Mars, and on planet as they attempted to stay alive, since there was absolutely no plan for getting them back to Earth. Despite literally being a death sentence, that competition drew over 200,000 applications from around the world, including a fictional one from the character Sheldon in Season 8 of The Big Bang Theory. Excited about this level of interest, TV networks started offering agreements with Lansdorp for broadcasting rights, originally expected to be worth untold billions of dollars. Selling these rights was to be the foundation of the capital raise required to make the project viable. Six billion dollars was the estimated cost for the first unmanned mission, a lander and orbiting communication satellite to be launched in 2016. The first manned mission was originally proposed to launch in 2023, but this kept getting pushed back as far as 2033 as it became obvious none of the published timetables were in fact feasible. Almost immediately, TV stations previously lining up for the rights in fall of 2014 started walking back or pulling their offers by February 2015, including DSP, which is the company known for producing Big Brother. At the height of Mars One's popularity, MIT took a look at the proposed mission architecture and determined it wasn't viable and that the astronauts would all die off quite quickly. Lockheed Martin, who was in talks with Mars One starting in 2013, also spoke up about the proposed timeline for Mars One launching a rover by 2018, since it had not yet given Lockheed Martin a green light for development of their Mars lander. Turned out, Mars One didn't have the cash to fund the project after all, and their Hail Mary Indiegogo campaign to pay off Lockheed Martin for the project fell just a bit short. One of the biggest red flags for the entire scheme should have been that the Mars 100 candidates weren't going to be chosen to participate because of their respective skill sets. Reportedly, the biggest determination factor for their election process was the contestants' ability to raise and donate money to the program, adding to the revenue streams from astronaut application fees, up to $75 a head, donations, private investment, IP rights, merchandising, and crowdfunding on Indiegogo. Despite all these revenue streams, the company went into administration January 15, 2019, and they did not emerge from reorganization. Which is curious, because today, their website is still up and running, still accepting your one-time or monthly donations through an active PayPal account in return for useless merchandise that will probably never be received. As it turns out, Bas Lansdorp made out much better than his investors through this entire process, with an estimated 2019 net worth of $10 million siphoned from this company that went bankrupt. It would appear he chose not to use his millions to make good on the million euro debt he created 
in his own foundation's name. Now, since Mars One has been exposed for what it was, more people now turned their attention to a new and ongoing set of promises made by another organization calling themselves the Gateway Foundation. Around the same time Lance Dorp was announcing his Mars One scheme, a retired commercial cargo pilot named John Blinkow from Rancho Cucamonga, California started work on his project called the Gateway Foundation. At the end of this segment, we'll share what we found out about both Blinkow and the Gateway Foundation, but for now, let's address the rotating space hotel with artificial gravity concept that he and his foundation have promised by the year 2025, since much of it applies to any such proposed orbiting space station or hotel. Just like with Mars One, the website gatewayspaceport.com is a highly polished collection of CGI images depicting a futuristic rotating space station whose size would put the ISS to shame. But one of the first things you'll notice watching the animation is that the proposed station seems to be different in each animation that the home page scrolls through, making it difficult to understand which of these structures they actually intend to build. Is it the skinny ring with the inflatable halves that parks starships, or the larger hotel that docks shuttles? Also, just like Mars One, there are two associated corporate entities involved in this. Where Mars One was split up into the Mars One Foundation and Mars One Ventures, the spaceport concept is the product of the Gateway Foundation and a company called Orbital Assembly, which has an identical list of corporate officers as the Foundation in the top positions. Didn't even use different photos. In their promotional videos, Blinko also mentions a third arm called Orbital Equity, but there's no more information on this to be found anywhere, so maybe they haven't gone full Madoff just yet. Their associated YouTube channel called The Gateway Foundation has about a dozen CGI animation videos that date back to 2015, depicting the promises of the Gateway and chronicling the changes in the concept over the past five years. Their earliest video from 2015 is a depiction of a patent filed by Blinko for a small truss assembly factory meant to operate in orbit. That was easy money for the patent office and patent lawyers, as the concept doesn't depict power sources, delivery services, machinery, or installation after the truss is assembled. Also, his patent doesn't seem to include the autonomous bots in the animation that seem to facilitate the process, and his concept seems to rely heavily on proprietary canadarm technology, which probably should have negated this patent altogether. The most recent video, released to their 48,000 subscribers four months ago, provides fodder for the masses who believe this project is real, which indicates the general public will be able to participate as crew if they sign up for an annual fee, and that this will be for a 2025 grand opening. That video has 784,000 views, with 15,000 likes and 765 dislikes, so right now, only 5% of the people watching these videos realize there's probably something wrong here. The channel's host and narrator is John Blinkow, who cites historical figures such as Konstantin Tsiolkovsky as he, with a straight face, tells the viewers about the types of drones they will build to facilitate construction by assisting astronauts. Observer drones, frog tongue drones, retriever drones. Most of these used for retrieving errant objects, but not actually conducting construction in any way. And it appears none of these have been developed to date, with a Kickstarter campaign meaning to raise funds for the development falling well short. Kind of like the Mars One Indiegogo campaign for their Mars Lander. Next to be depicted are construction bots that are actually built for NASA by bot manufacturers such as the Robonaut from General Motors, as well as rigger spacesuits that will need to be designed from scratch, manufactured by, and bought from ILC Dover. So it would seem this entire venture depends heavily on a great deal of proprietary technology that the Foundation neither developed nor licensed. As an example, there are 44 SNC Dream Chasers on 22 mounts set around one of the station designs as life rafts. The SNC Dream Chaser is still in prototype testing, so a cost per vehicle cannot be determined just yet. But we do know the Vulcan Centaur rockets they intend to use to launch Dream Chasers into orbit start at about 80 mil and go up to 200 million dollars apiece. So let's lowball it and pretend it will be the lower number. At 80 million dollars each, that's 3.52 billion dollars in launch cost to LEO. Now let's say the craft itself will be a similar amount, that's another 3.52 billion. 
bringing us to over $7 billion. At the top end of the launch costs, this would balloon to over $12 billion for life rafts. As a side note, these Dream Chasers are positioned incorrectly for entry, as persons entering the craft from the aft axis would fall straight down into the cockpit windshield, not walk along the floor like they're designed to do. Now there is a fix for this that's easy enough, and if the Chief Architect would like to get in touch with us for a consult, they can request their email down below in the comments so we can discuss our fees. Additionally, these machines will have to be installed before the space station begins rotating, since they will not be able to be replaced while the ship is in motion. Which is maybe why on the spaceport they have removed them altogether. No life rafts. Doesn't look like there's any on the larger model at all. Another thing that is conspicuously absent are solar panels, which should be plastered on every square meter of this structure that will face the sun in order to reach the 56.1 megawatts of solar power they claim the station will produce and require. John Blinkow claims his assembly bots will be able to build the 190 meter wide outer ring structure of the Von Braun station in quote just a few days. Further, once the truss is in place, he believes the rest of the station will be worked on by 80 people and they will have the majority of the structure in place in just six months. In this video, the inner ring structure housing the docking ports appears to be stationary as a craft resembling the Starship approaches for docking. Once the arms are secured to the craft, the hub appears to speed back up and match the rotation of the outer rings. Such a system would require seals, guides and rails along the entire perimeter of the inner structure to maintain a constant seal with the outer structure. But anything in motion against the stationary surface is going to have some form of friction and therefore degradation of the materials. In space, to our knowledge, no such rotating seal technology exists. To get from the inner ring to the outer hub modules, visitors would have to ride in one of four elevator shafts to the outer ring structure. And again, to our knowledge, microgravity elevator technology built for space stations does not yet exist and has not been tested. Now, let's compare that to our only historical example. The ISS is the biggest structure currently in orbit. It was built primarily using the space shuttle, using a modular concept framework until 2010 when the shuttles were decommissioned. 36 shuttle flights were dedicated strictly to station construction. No major modules have been delivered to the ISS since. Those costs were split between 15 partner nations with a total cost from 1998 to 2010 in excess of $160 billion. But this slick spaceport animation promo claims it will only cost $60 billion to build a spaceport structure that appears to be able to fit the ISS and its parking garage and will be staffed and awaiting its first paying customers in 2025. Let's run some numbers, shall we? The ISS weighs 419,725 kilograms and has a volume of 916 cubic meters, giving it a ratio of 458 kilos per cubic meter. The spaceport declares it will have a pressurized volume of 11,906,250 cubic meters and at 458 kilos per cubic meter, that would give the station a comparable total mass of 5.5 billion kilos. That's a complete lowball figure when comparing the ISS materials to the type of structure featured in the animations. Always a topic of debate, current launch costs are quoted by NASA on their website at $18,500 per kilo delivered to LEO, so at that rate it would cost $100 trillion just to launch these raw construction materials into space, which of course includes neither the cost of those materials nor the cost of assembly. So that $60 billion quoted by Blinkow would not even qualify as a down payment on a down payment on a down, well, you get the idea. Really, the entire premise is already laughable, but just for fun, we are going to do what we always do with such wild claims. We're going to assume they can make good on every false promise they're making about building the station and doing it within their proposed timeline. And we'll just ignore the stupid amount of money it would cost to launch 100,000 super heavy payloads into orbit. And yet, we're still going to demonstrate how ridiculous this idea is. Right after the break. Get up for a stretch and grab a beverage, then click on part two when you're ready, because we're going to do a deep dive into this Gateway Foundation, and we're going to really explore what it would take to pull off their rotating orbiting hotel.